Welcome back, everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Bell. Dr. Anibal Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm super excited to welcome back to our show, Jim Thomas. He's one of our favorite EFT trainers. You've probably seen him on some of um, my previous uh, EFT Talk episodes as you know, he specializes in addiction and works with shame. He's worked in residential and wilderness communities and agency settings, and he just has a brilliant mind and a really big heart. So we're super blessed to welcome back today. Before we get to today's topic, you know, just want to remind everyone, if you haven't checked out my book on Amazon, uh, con- uh, Using Relentless Empathy in Challenging in the Therapeutic Relationship. Sorry, it's such a mouthful that I always forget. Using relen- Relentless Empathy in the Therapeutic Relationship, Connecting with Challenging and Difficult Clients. And no doubt, a lot of the topics we cover in the EFT Talks will bring up a variety of topics or client dynamics that you find challenging. And so my book hopefully will offer some valuable resources and it's a really easy read for the busy therapist. So uh, find it on Amazon and uh, hopefully you pick that up. And today, Jim is going to join us in talking about, I guess you could call it either binge drinking disorders or like intermittent kinds of addictions that can be hard to track with couples in the cycle because of the nature, the fact that they don't occur with regularity. So um, thank you again, Jim, for being with us today and back on our show. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. And the book, I just tell people read the Relentless Empathy book and (laughs) and don't give the full title, but it's a powerful just exploration of how there's just really not anything that comes into your office where relentless empathy would be a bad thing to do, you know, and and it's well written. It's got nice chapters about sort of specific difficult types of situations and couples and clients. And I, I highly recommend it. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. And like you said, it's a, it's a great book for the busy therapist. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, and we do talk about addiction in the book. So Jim, let's catch folks up to speed. If, if they haven't, watched any of our previous episodes um, talking about addiction, how would we kind of understand addiction through the EFT lens, which is the attachment lens? Yeah, absolutely. So this is this is really important for me personally and professionally and, and uh, my kind of the big wheelhouse that I'm operating in a lot right now is um, I'm doing talks with some of the uh, countries where therapists don't make much in the EFT world, places like South Africa and Turkey and stuff, and talking about addiction, talking about shame, just as a give back, you know, to say, hey, I'm resourced. These are important topics. I'll be happy to talk. And I've been bringing um, with some, a colleague the, this attachment lens into the residential and wilderness recovery program world. And it's so powerful because once you start to, to look at addiction through the attachment lens, Um, it opens things up to me, like it opens up to relentless empathy to start that um, these are adaptive strategies that people get into. They're dealing with something that's lacking. They're dealing with something that's missing. They're dealing with pain as like Gabor Mate would say, he talks about, Mm -hmm. you know, rather than asking why the addiction, he says, where's the pain, right? Where's the pain? I also believe, you know, zooming out, that addiction is a, is a response in a lot of ways to toxic culture and mm-hmm. to this, there's so many ways to not feel accepted or not feel like you belong and not feel like you're cared for or can care mm-hmm. for other people. Um, so to think about addiction through an attachment lens is like Phil, Philip Flores back in 2004 um, published a book, Addiction as an Attachment Disorder. And we see research, I was just reading a study that came out in 2021, another meta-analysis showing a high correlation with insecure attachment styles and the chances of a substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, We see it in gambling. We see Mm -hmm. it in uh, so many things where we get caught in like compulsive behaviors that are- are And it can be nurtured by society too, 
Yeah. Like I live in Las Vegas, which is, you know, probably the addiction capital of the United States, at least, if not the world. And it's like for a lot of professions out here, you know, um, alcohol is like social currency, right? It's like you get mm. together and you drinks and that's what you do. You go and you see an entertainer. The way that you would show your appreciation is to buy them a drink. Um, you can't even get your hair cut without being offered wine. You know, you can't go and paint, you know, art on canvas without being offered wine. It's, it's so accessible and it's so normalized as like, hey, let's have alcohol with everything we do. But it does speak to that heart of attachment is that we can feel that sense of belonging when we're hanging out together and connecting while having drinks. So it can become associated with social bonding. Well, and there's some evidence that binge drinking is associated with some social anxieties that I'm in a social mm -hmm. situation and I start to drink to, to drop my guard and I get lost in that. I get, it's like an impulsive um, thing. And I, and I end up drinking more than is healthy for me in a very short period of time. And when you're asking about like, you know, binge drinking versus alcoholism, you'll see in the literature that some people say, well, binge drinking isn't alcoholism because I can put off the next drink. Other people will say it's just a particular form of alcoholism in which you're able to put off the next drink, but you lose control while drinking. Um, yeah. And that, that would be important because it does, it does make it harder for both the client and the therapist to see what's happening as an addiction, even though, you know, probably one person in the partnership and the therapist themselves may recognize that when the drinking occurs, it is problematic. Like it, you know, but it's hard. It can be so hard to put that into the cycle when it doesn't happen with some kind of predictability or consistency. It's more like randomly dispersed. But whenever it happens, it's like to excess. And then the client themselves isn't even like really connected to that loss of control, right? Like, oh, I don't think it's a problem. I'm just going out and de-stressing and hanging with my buddies, you know, after like, two months and it's not a big deal, except, you know, like what if, even if it only happens like once or twice a year, you know, like, you know, you're gambling $20,000 as opposed to, oh, I had a budget of a hundred bucks and somehow ended up to be 20,000 or, you know, I'm drinking with my buddies, but then every time I go out drinking with them, I fall asleep and security calls my wife or, you know, they, I pass out somewhere and they can't find me. And the wife and the kids are driving around at midnight trying to find their loved one because they can't get a hold of them. You know, like each time that it does happen, it, it can become like this wrecking ball through the relationship. Right. How exactly. do we, yeah. yeah. So that's important. What you're talking about is that when, when if we're going to sort of separate these in a dichotomous way, sort of a, chronic drinking pattern of I'm drinking most nights. It's kind of predictable that I'm probably going to get at least mildly intoxicated tonight and it impacts our cycle. You feel me either withdrawing from you and numbing out, or you, you feel me escalating into my like anxious, insecure place and coming at you in a critical way is different than I don't drink that often. Um, but then I do, and I get intoxicated and, and get maybe blackout, the drink to excess. And those are the stories you're telling. Like uh, my, your friends call and say, can you come get Jim? He's blotto. He's trying to drive home. We took his keys. He refuses to Uber. Um, we're afraid the police are going to come type thing. Mm -hmm. And then another type of binge drinking is the old and back in, when I was growing up, they would have called it a bender. You know, you go the lost weekend. I drink mm -hmm. from, you know, Friday through Sunday night. And I, I don't remember much of it. Um, and that's exactly right. What you're saying, it starts to impact my sense of safety with you because now anytime you drink, I don't know, is this a time yeah. that it's going to go to excess mm -hmm. that you drink to a loss of control. Um, you drink to a place that yes, blackouts are common with people who mm -hmm. binge drink. It's interesting yeah. too, that there's an association since you're in Vegas, um, between people that are prone to binge drinking, there's a correlation with then other risk behaviors like paying for sex and gambling. Mm -hmm. And it, mm -hmm. there is some evidence that it may be this, this Coupling. overlay between 
you know, in an attachment sense, I'm, I'm having difficulty regulating here. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to turn to you as a partner or to family and stuff to get that co-regulation with a, a kind of impulsiveness that in the distressful situation, I impulsively turn to alcohol. And though I know from experience that there's a really good chance I'm going to lose control of that mm-hmm. drinking, but I go for it anyway, you know. And mm-hmm. I think the other thing you were talking about is that kind of rationalization that happens. It's like this only happens sometimes. Mm-hmm. I'm like not an alcoholic. Did. I don't mm-hmm. need it. I can go without it. I can go with, you know, and this puts so a lot. Why of- is it a big deal? It only happens once a year and I work really hard. What's the big deal? Yeah, I let my hair down and went to Vegas and got a DUI and got in trouble and told my boss off and almost lost my job. And it puts the partner in a really horrible place. You know, if you are are with a loved one or a a friend, a a sibling, a parent, an adult child or something where you but you don't understand that when you do this, you you, there's often associated with binge drinking, too, or excessive drinking is this like change in persona or the way you're showing up you get so angry or you get so maudlin you get so intense your shame comes out in these really intense ways and you start talking about you're not texting me while you're doing this and saying things about yourself that that later when you're not in your binge you're like i don't know what you're talking about Mm -hmm. you know i want to show you the text and now i'm put in this position of of trying to demonstrate to you that when you go to this place, great damage happens. And you're talking about it's so common that the person says, but it's a rarity. Mm -hmm. But then it exists for the partner as like a constant. Right. They, and they minimize the impact on their partner. And also you kind of find, which is still, I think a commonality with even like more consistent, regular addiction, like alcoholism, you know, where, when they're in the moment of it, they also aren't attuned to how will this affect my partner, right? They're they're not really tuned into that. But real quickly, before we, you know, further go on to this, you mentioned co-regulation. And for those who maybe are new to EFT or new to attachment, can you kind of explain what we mean by co-regulation and why that's important? So it's like we're elegantly designed to, we're social mammals. Um, we have a limbic system that, in a study, Lewis et al. talked about the limbic system above the human on uh, social mammals, but us in particular, exists for the synchronous exchange of emotional cues and states. And, um, and when we are able to do that, and I have a felt sense of you, and I can turn to you either as an internal, you know, call you up and remember you or call you and mm-hmm. say, Hey, I'm in a shame spiral or I'm having a really bad day and I need to connect. Um, mm-hmm. We call this is we, we regulate and soothe anxious states and we feel less mm-hmm. alone in the world. I'm, I'm walking the hill of life. As Jim Cohen says, if you're holding my hand, the, the grade might be this steep, but it doesn't feel as hard to walk it. I can carry more. I can, I can, do more. I get, it's like Popeye eating spinach. Connection is like spinach. And now I can go out yeah. into the world and slay dragons again. Yeah. And this and is it, key because a, that physiological response. Yeah, too, the physiological because, response. So addiction comes. Oh, good. Sorry. I was just going to say real quick, when we, when we're stressed, our body releases cortisol, which yeah. is stress hormone releases adrenaline. Now addiction can release dopamine, which is, can be powerful, but it stimulates a different part of the brain than oxytocin and vasopressin, which are two hormones associated with bonding and not just not cuddling bonding. Um, So a oxytocin vasopressin is a hormone that our body releases to help us manage pressure, AKA stress. When we get those, it also turns off the cortisol, the adrenaline and helps us feel have more energy resources to fight the the dragons in the world. So it's like literally you help the chemical composition of my body shift so that I have more energy to deal with the demands of life just by being in connection with me. Yes. It's a bit. So one of the things that seems to be true is that, a lot of the substances, alcohol, the opiates, um, mm-hmm. 
actually do go in and like alcohol mimics a lot of the effects of oxytocin. Yeah. Um, the, the warm, fuzzy, like the insula, um, you know, when you feel, we talk about like a lot. And when I feel safe with somebody, I get warm. I feel warm. I get yeah. this warm fuzzy that's coming from a part of the brain of yeah. the communicate safety of vasopressin, you know, getting released when you, when I can connect with you. And so one of the things that happens with like alcohol, which we would associate with binge drinking, <laughs> drinking yeah. alcohol, is it's literally going in and chemically going into those same parts of us and giving us a, a, like a, a semblance of um, that's generally numbing and, and depressive to the nervous system, but a semblance of that warmth in the beginning. You know, the people when they're like binge drinkers aren't setting out to get wasted. Usually they want that, um, that warmth, that, that vasopressin and oxytocin feeling. And then they, when I talk to people about it, it's like, I end up chasing that now I'm chasing it and I can't get a, I, I have to drink more. I'm getting a diminishing return. Um, but now I start, I'm socially feeling much more relaxed and engaged. So then I chase that and I'm getting some semblance of connection when I'm, I'm losing touch with my actual emotional, you know, like your physiological the part of me that needs yeah. my partner to, to soothe me. So yes, it becomes yeah. like a substitute attachment. It's a yeah. way to, it's a way to lower my distress. I that's agree. scary and upsetting and triggering for family, yeah. friends and partner. And it can be damaging not only to relationship, but to your life, but also to your health as well. Cause it, Oh yeah. You know, they mm-hmm. still, the alcohol is a toxin. We're going to stick with alcohol, right? <laughs> alcohol is a, the Gates foundation, compiled all this data from years of studies, spent five years doing it. And they announced back in like 2020, what's the safe amount of alcohol to have physically? None. Mm. We've thought for a long time that like drinking wine, a glass of wine is good for your health. But what it actually looks like, it's more of an economic issue that uh, people who tend to choose wine as a drink uh, tend to, to, have a higher economic resources and what they're probably were picking up is the benefits of having um the economic resources to get health care as you need it and take better care of yourself and so it's not really the glass of wine it's like a correlation not a cause and, well also uh, too like does that does that also factor into like even with these other binges you know like like cocaine you know there's like the white collar drugs and then there's like the blue collar drugs, you know, where like you see the the Wall Street guys in these clubs doing cocaine. And even though I only do it, you know, like Sometimes, once in a right? while. Yeah. Yeah. And it it's still like all these substances still chemically alter you, which helps you feel better. But the point is that it causes other damage. But for a lot of folks, it's like, unless there's kind of physical consequences, almost like the relational consequences, at least in their partner's experience, isn't enough for them to see it as a problem. And that's tough. It's like, oh, because nothing bad's happening. So yeah, you know, like, security has to call you when I over drink or my friends call you, but you know, I still get to go back to my job. I haven't gotten a DUI, you know, like there's no serious life altering consequences. Yeah. That's where good EFT or attachment work is going to come in because I want to slow all that down. We get practical about it. That this is common what you're describing, right? I, there's something like on occasion when I get together with my college friends, we do some Coke and get wild I sometimes drink to excess, but it's not regular. I gamble sometimes and lose control and then I don't do it. And I don't understand why you can't see that that's the exception, not the rule. And I really don't understand why you're making a big deal of it. And now we're into that like protest polka that you're criticizing me for something that, that I may experience as an escape or I'm letting my hair down or I have you know, shame in here. I go to, I don't go to a good place when I'm binging. I don't feel good about it. I come out of it with like a, um, an emotional hangover. And I don't know how to tell you that because I have the rat-a-tat-tat of you're telling me 
you know, mm. how bad it is. You're trying to convince me. I go into my defensive withdrawal position and say, it's not that bad. Look at all the other things I do. And now we're talking about the EFT tango. You know, I mean, the EFT cycle and applying that EFT tango to go and make that process observation about it looks like this cocaine use or this gambling or this rage that comes up just sometimes. It's only every seven months. But when you get that mad, you say or do things that really scare your partner's limbic system and they are not letting go of it. They, they can't, they're waiting for the next time. Every little frustration is leading them to wonder, is this going to be a rage outburst to binge drinking? That how do we slow that down and, and do the relentless empathy, the core of move two, for both people, right? For what's it like for you that your partner sometimes disappears for a weekend? What's it like for you that you don't disappear that often and he, she, or they are so mad and trying to really tell you that makes you a really bad person and slow that cycle down and start to find out what does this substance do and not do? How is the use of this substance adaptive for this person, makes sense to them, it's bringing something to them, it has consequences. This is a core definition of addiction is, right? I continue to do a behavior in spite of negative consequences, right? Um, and then how to help the partner access what we do in loving interventions. What's it like for you to see them do this? I understand the impact on you, but what's it like you know, I get scared seeing you do this. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to lose you. I'm afraid someday you're not going to, they're not going to find you when you get lost. The last time they found you, you were in an alley, you know, and, and couldn't remember what city you were in. What if I never found you again? I'm like a scared, you know, friend or parent that's lost. I'm, I've, our dogs run away and I know where the dog is. Like I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm attached to you and I care about you and I care about what this substance or this behavior does to you. Or if you come to something like, you know, rage, I need you to understand that when this happens, I can't let go of the consequence to my heart because it only happens mm -hmm. seven months in these particular circumstances. And I'm You're talking about the partner's rage as an emotional consequence of in the cycle of the impact of this happening. Yeah, what's what's happening to the in the face of that rage. So it's just like both and that like, I have to start describing to you what it's like when you disappear. And I have to also start sharing with you. It's scary and sad that you disappear. When I, when I think about rage, you know, rage is, is a tough one to have empathy for mm -hmm. and to ask a partner to like, you know, I need to understand what's triggering you can be any of these things. If you start what's triggering the binge, what's tr triggering the gambling, what's triggering there's often a, a sense of, I'm going to be blamed for this behavior you're engaging in. Mm -hmm. It's somehow the therapist is going to bring it back down because of this attachment lens to the, I binge because there's something missing in the relationship. Um, so that's tricky too, right? Don't want to find yourself sort of turning to a part. To, 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 it's like in affair recovery work. You don't want mm -hmm. to come jumping in to say, well, there's a reason they had the affair what was missing in the relationship people that's that happens way down the recovery process mm -hmm. when i feel like you really understand the impact of this drinking or this intermittent behavior on us and we can start to heal that i need you to know that i i fear for you and it hurts me and this is eft work this is attachment work what's yeah. what's the consequence of this over time you say you don't binge drink that often, but I've been with you 15 years. And for me, it's 44 times now. Yeah. 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 And, and it can affect even, you know, where the partner then becomes so afraid whenever the, the binging partner wants to go out. It's like, is this going to be the time when that happens? And right. then they get really anxious and put all this pressure and I think it's probably easier for therapists to feel like they have empathy for the partner who's on the receiving end of this but maybe harder to climb into the experience of the one who is turning to the alcohol, especially when they're like, I don't know what I'm feeling. I'm just having fun. Like, what's the big deal? You know, they're really 
and how they're not even connected to their own stopping mechanisms. The part that might kick online that says, mm-hmm. I think you've had enough or not enough um, that keeps going. How do you even begin to climb into that? Well, I want to meet people where they're, where they're at. There's a great book that talks about this quite a bit by, by a Dr. Bugatti called <laughs> Sympathy. I want to, you know, and we did a talk about empathy where I talked about this a lot of people, you know, meeting people where they are and, and finding it in yourself, you know, that I probably have some things that I do, even though I know they're not great for me and I continue to do them, you know, I, I, you know, the doctor told me my blood pressure is too high, but I still eat salty food or something. And I, so or I try not to shop very often, but then when I do, yeah. I end up spending $500 in hiding the credit card bill and my partner gets really upset and then doesn't right. trust me with the bank account. Or, yeah. You know. And so, so a little humility of like, you know, I, I know, look for me, I, I'm in recovery. It's been a long time since I used a substance other than caffeine, right? I, um, um, fortunately they don't, they keep trying to find a lot of harm in caffeine and then there isn't much and actually can push dementia off and stuff. So I can, it's not is it an addiction or just something I like to do every day. But, 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 um, I have to, I try to remember like if, if a certain things that happen and I didn't have certain resources, I could be, you know, not here and I could have died from it. I, I could have certainly gone on a much different path within relationships and all these things. So it's sort of finding in yourself, um, we all turn to things that are adaptive in some way. They're tapping into some, this chemical is overlaying over, you know, an attachment drive and a desire to feel connected. And something is, you know, that there must be, there's a cause for this correlation that like insecure attachment is so correlated with a higher risk for substance abuse. And it's like securely attached adolescents are much more likely to experiment and move mm-hmm. on. Insecurely attached are much more likely to get stuck there. That it's it's mimicking and taking care of and substituting for connection. And then, so here's the beauty. Well, hold on real quick. While you're in that yeah. place, I'm having a little bit of a light bulb. What if a client doesn't connect to you know, like the social currency necessarily of it, using it as a desire for connection, but maybe the complete opposite of a desire for disconnection, maybe not necessarily from their partner, but from stress, from life's responsibilities. Yeah, that's very common. So the answer to all those questions is, so what the presumption that I tend to make when these things are happening is there's a core isolation and loneliness in there. So like the hold me tight conversation, page 95, you know, in Sue's book, where she walks through the protest, like the what's their dance, and then says, and this, and this leaves us both in pain and isolation, that there's some part of this person that keeps turning to this that's alone, and no one's met them there. And I want to meet them there. And I, want to, and I have to start with what they say, oh, it's no big deal to you. And I start with it's no big deal to you. When I get curious and I keep asking about the experience and what they get from it and I sit there and then what's it like to have him or her or them coming at you like this, telling you it is a big deal. People start to drop down into the underlying deeper part of the experience. I very rarely in my career over 35 years of doing this have had people who just say, you know, I love binge drinking it's the best thing ever and I'm holding on to it. Or I, I just doing this cocaine every three months with my friends is essential to my existence. I believe that if you meet people where they are, you'll start to surface what's getting numbed out or how it's elevating my mood to get away from something or it's spacing me out like pot tends to kind of like space people out. And so they're just sort of away from the experience. And the actual experience of a therapist caring enough to come in and try to find out what's this like for you is a relational experience. It starts to bring up attachment emotions. It starts to bring up, well, it does hurt in this relationship. It, I do get sad. I am lonely. And now they can start to have an experience with me that's more attachment-based. And I can help them start turning to their partner and sending those clearer signals that Sue talks about. Like, I need to talk about 
my experience in this relationship, and maybe we don't go right after binge drinking. We don't go right after the cocaine use. We try to surface the underlying, the heart, the lonely, isolated or wounded heart of both parties. Um, so we can start to bring them closer together. Then in that closeness, we can start to turn and let's start to address then how binge drinking or whatever that intermittent behavior is, is exacerbating this cycle Mm -hmm. and keeping you down and below and hidden. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. So I'm just thinking um, about my own clients. And again, in Vegas, even if you don't specialize in addiction, it really finds its way into your therapy room a lot because it is just everywhere. Um, and you know, even bars out here are different than they are in other cities. They're basically well, can I say something about what, what you're talking about that's important is because a lot of the way we try to think, do I have a problem is we compare ourselves to other people. Mm-hmm. And if you're hanging out in a culture where everybody's using to excess, mm-hmm. it's going to be hard to see yourself as using to excess, right? It is the yeah. party capital. Yeah. And even, you know, like bars here, just like restaurants that kids can't go to, you know, so it's a, it's just a fun escape for a whole lot of people, you know, it's so different than it is in other places. And so, you know, as you're talking about this, cause I'm thinking if I went right for the one who binge drinks, they would probably wouldn't correlate it to feeling lonely, but if you went to the relationship end, I think these clients would talk about feeling lonely and and the way that they escape and self-soothe is is always separate. Like there's no escaping together, no turning towards right. each other as a resource of fun, as support, as stress relief. It's always like, you go do your thing once in a while and I'll go do my thing. And because we have kids and a busy work schedule, it's like we can only get out once in a while. And so we're like so pent up with stress energy that, you know, again, it's like, well, at, at some point I just stopped caring about how much alcohol I've had or, you know, how many hits of weed that I've had or how many lines of cocaine I've done or, you know, you know regulate me and manage the distress and it's familiar. I kind of know what the impact's going to be where you're unpredictable. You're like a porcupine. If I try to hug you, I mm-hmm. might get hurt. If I hug Jack Daniels or I hug, you know, I, smoke a bowl or something Mm -hmm. i don't have that complication yeah and it seems like it's so hard so challenging to even get the partner who's turning to the substance to even buy into the idea that they're regulating some emotion they're like so disconnected from their own emotional experience they're like so what i'm stressed or i'm just going to have fun i'm escaping like i don't I'm not connected to feeling overloaded or overwhelmed. I'm just like, oh, I finally get a break. So if I can say just style-wise for me, I, I don't, I rarely talk about as an EFT therapist or attachment work, I rarely say like, do you realize what's happening here is you're turning to this to get emotional regulation. It's an experiential model for me. I like this, you know, less explaining, more experiencing if it helps them to organize it coming out of the experience. Okay. So what I'm trying to do like, is I want to meet you where you are and, and be with you in this position you're caught up in, in this attachment to stress dance with this person and the, and the dance you have with this substance. And both of you have a dance with the substance. If you're not both using, like you're not both binge drinking, um, you, you might have a similar one, like two people who binge drink together every three months may say, we don't mind. We just do it together. Um, so I have a relationship with the alcohol. You have a relationship with the alcohol. And I, I had a powerful experience recently where I'm working with a, a person who their partner talked about what, what happens to me when you binge drink. They talked about, you know, and we're kind of like you said, I'm ambivalent. I don't know. I think I, should, I can manage it. I don't see what's a big deal. And I asked a question because they could see their bond. They've done some really nice work on the relationship now. And we're coming back to alcohol. And I just said, what would your bond say about alcohol? And the person who was using, immediately the conversation switched. Mm. My bond would say that alcohol has been harming us for 22 years. 
Mm. I've always known it. And the whole conversation, because I'm talking from the emotions that they've surfaced and gotten in touch with because it didn't go directly at them in terms of you have an alcohol problem, you have an alcohol mm-hmm. problem, I'm going to label your alcohol problem. Um, I, I help them start to wake up their emotions, wake up their attachment system. So often the person that's using is in that withdrawn position. They're trying to deactivate the strategy, right? Samson said this so powerfully at like the 2014 EFT conference said, befriend this strategy Mm -hmm. with that relentless empathy. It wakes them up. I am lonely in this relationship. I've been lonely for a long time. And when they trust that, and then I can say to them, and when did alcohol first come in? Or when did pot first come in? When did gambling first come in? When did porn come in? When did spending come in to help you with that? Mm. You're friend of me. And that's a different thing than I need you to see. And I want to catch you in this place. So if you're watching the video version of this, sorry, if you're listening to the podcast, you won't be able to see our, our movements. But if you're watching this, you know, my head was kind of up. You know, as I was like trying to cognitively process how to get in that door. And then when you dropped into what would your bond say about this, I noticed my body shifted down and I can even feel like myself take a deep breath as my body resonated like, whoa, that's profoundly different and deeper. And, you know, you're right. I think a lot of the anxious therapists and, you know, possibly other approaches might be tempted to try to beat down the front door and, and put it like, oh, but this is a problem. We need to like come straight at it and say, this is a problem. And EFT does confront problematic behavior, but in the EFT way. And we know that if you beat down that front door, they're just going to keep trying to reinforce it and nail it shut. And we're not, and this is what I talk about in my book, and we're not going to be able to get them to a place where they are open to change. They're just going to keep digging in and to their defenses, their attachment strategies. So it's kind of like you're saying, you kind of go through the back door, right? Because especially if it's a withdrawer, what happens when you pursue a withdrawer who's not feeling safe, who's not a securely engaged withdrawer, when you pursue them and the role of the therapist is more of a pursuer position, then they're going to keep withdrawing and they're going to well, let's be clear about that because this is a, this is important. This is a little I, I, this is helpful to me. If you're anxiously pursuing them, but if you're from coming from a a more secure place, and I want to know you, you know, I don't want to leave you alone. Right. I don't want to leave you alone. And we know when we look at research on things like pe- people are you know using heroin, for example, they they're they don't want to be using heroin and they want to be found and they want to be helped. And they have a compelling addiction that chemically is like, you know, somebody told me once the first time Jim, I used heroin, it was like 10,000 of the best hugs you could ever imagine. And I didn't have to take any risk emotionally to get them. And that's compelling, right? That, that to come towards someone and say, I understand that just for the grace of like, circumstance, context, the grace of God, however you want to think about it, I could be in this too. And I see you struggling. And I see people all telling you that it's because you've got a problem with a drug or a substance. They're not meeting you as a person. And I have to meet you as a person. And then when you feel some safety with me, and I start asking you about the substance, you can tell me about your relationship to the substance, because you know, I'm interested in you. And then we see this in research, like the term alcoholic or addict keeps a lot of people from going to get help. Mm -hmm. They don't want that label. Now that people get into the recovery world, and for a lot of people, that's a very helpful term. It helps them organize the experience and et cetera. I want to know you're a person sitting in front of me that happens to binge drink or happens to gamble or happens to snort cocaine or happens to get lost. You know, you you, you know, you say to me, I've only had three prostitutes in our whole marriage three times. I don't know what the big deal is. Well, I want to understand what was happening to you that led you to go pay for that affection, that sex, whatever that was for you. Um, and I have to, to, to communicate to you clearly, like in your Relentless Empathy book, 
that I care about how you got here. Yeah. I care about how you ended up binge drinking when you know, I know deep down inside, I'm probably going to most likely 95% of the time come to a place if I'm caring and curious, yeah. you'll start letting me know the cost of that binge drinking, the cost mm -hmm. of that um, to your bond. I love that. I'm trying to wake up the attachment system in that person. Yes. Emotionally. I love that. I love that. And, I, and thank you for making that distinction, right? So, you know, the difference between anxiously pursuing, which again, I think some therapists can fall into when they see problematic behavior and their alarm bells are going off and they're like, oh my God, oh my God. And we know from the science, from the research that, you know, when we, when we try to do that, you know, it doesn't lead to great outcomes, right? But seeing the person, this is why we do EFT is because we're really trying to see somebody's humanity. We're trying to see somebody's heart underneath the behavior that's on the surface. And, you know, when we get to know them as a person, they feel like we're actually interested in them and not just judging them or criticizing them. Um, then it's easier to feel safe. Okay, can I close with this? Like, yeah. so if we think about it if, if, now, not every person that's been drinking and stuff is an emotional withdrawer. Like there's, there are people who, when they imbibe, um, their anxious pursuit comes full bore. And now they're coming at you with your, yeah, you know, you're never going to be there for me. Um, right. But oh, so yeah. much of the time. I got time, pursuers that are addicts yeah, too, right? Yeah. But so much of the time it's a withdrawn position, a lonely position. And I say this, if I were doing a workshop on addiction and then when I do a workshop on withdrawal, um, avo avoidant attachment, they have this similarity. And I think about, I s often I'll start by saying, it's like the poetry. It's going to take a lot of love to change the way things are. It's going to take a lot of love before we get too far. So if you look in my direction, we don't see eye to eye, my heart, needs protection and so do I. And then I'll pause and I'll say, I want you to think about and reflect on that withdrawal or that person struggling with a substance inside you or in your life or a loved one or a client. And I want you to know a great truth that somewhere deep inside their attachment system is whispering and calling out, find me, would somebody please find me? I'm lost. Hmm. And I don't want you to go away. If, if I start pushing you away and you're, you're interested in me and we've got a point of contact and you say to me, you say, Jim, I'm getting uncomfortable talking about all these emotions. We do that for me, like a role play. I say, Jim, I'm getting uncomfortable talking about all these emotions. Would you back off? Can you do that for me right now? Just be the client for a moment and say, Jim, I'm getting- Jim, I'm uncomfortable with all these emotions. Would you back off? And then I go like this. What am I replicating? The cycle. Now say it again. Would you back off? Jim, I'm uncomfortable. Would you back off? Did I get too close? Is it hard to have me interested in what's happening? Is it hard to service all this? With you? Do you really want, do you want me to go away? That's different. And I think this is what we're doing with people that are lost in addiction, whether it's binge drinking or some other addiction or compulsion that keeps them distant and separated and they can't connect with their partner in the way they long to, but they've had to down-regulate for so long or avoiding detachment. And they have a, it has a lot of similarity. We're calling out to them saying, Ali, Ali, income free. I'm here. I won't run away, but I won't come in and push either. I'll stay at the point of contact, which is what you learn in trauma. Mm -hmm. You're falling apart and dysregulating in my office. I don't get to go away. I stand still right at the point of contact and start repeating your name. Where are you going, Annabelle? Where are you going? Where are you going? What's happening? What's happening with this binge drinking? What's happening with this gambling? What's happening when you get so rageful and then you feel like crap? a month afterwards what's happening to you i want to know and i don't want to leave you alone in that yeah and i want that's, to help a partner to be there for you that's so amazing and 
Again, for those of you listening to the podcast version, not watching the video, what Jim did was the first time we role played that. And I said, I'm uncomfortable with you back up. He rolled his chair back to the other side of his room to demonstrate the going away. And then he came back and said, you know, what, what am I replicating? Right. So then we replay that where then he kept his chair close and, and had a different approach. So that that's what we were doing. If you're not watching the video version, but I, this really speaks to why I think you and I both love EFT and practice EFT is like, we go into the behavior, whatever the behavior is. And we find the person, we find the humanity and that's first and foremost, like kind of our number one mission is to find the humanity and be with the person. Old Moore's, uh, the Nalani Kalamar said to me the other day on the phone, I'm always saying to people she's mentoring, you know, hold more in your heart. Yeah. Hold more. I think about being in the struggle, be in the struggle, be with, and you know, the, if you had the same experiences and resources and history and stuff, you'd probably be doing the same thing. Yeah. So that's the root of Carl Rogers humanism that Sue brought into EFT. That's right. That's right. And I love, you know, two of our, our trainers, Jeff and Levin in Belgium, who oh, do a domestic. Yes. Yeah. They do a workshop on domestic violence. And I love Levin says, be with people suffering. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what we're doing is they're suffering from addiction or they're suffering from violence. Go and be with people in their suffering. And, and it's like, oh, it seems so obvious, but yet how many of us therapists actually lose track of that when the person's sitting in front of us and we just want to go after the behavior and say, this needs to stop, or don't you see this is addiction or blah, blah, blah. Or fix it or give advice yeah. or anything other than be with the suffering. Yeah, yeah. Be the, it's a theme of a lot of the talks that people have with you. Yeah. There's different yeah. ways and different styles to be with the suffering. I loved uh, your, the talk with Doc Hawk, James Hawkins recently, you know, be with the suffering when there's social, you know, justice and, 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 and breaches across culture and stuff. How can we be with the suffering, mm-hmm. you know, instead of, yeah. So I thank you for this. I, I always enjoy your questions and talking about things and you know, oh, we, we could do another hour. Oh yes. And believe me, we will. We're definitely going to have Jim back on because, you know, Jim, you just have such an incredible wealth of knowledge, but just, you have an incredible heart. Mm-hmm. And every time you're on, it's like, we get to experience your heart and your warmth and you, you specialize in some of what the field of of therapists in general might accept as some of the more challenging client dynamics and struggles. And you do it with such wonderful and beautiful humanity. And it's so touching and it's infectious in a good way because it just really softens. I think it brings the tone and just reminds us all about how to be better humans, you know, That's just amazing. So thank you so much, Jim. And for those who are just meeting you for the first time, or for those who are returning, but, you know, would love to maybe get in touch with you or look you up and see where you're training or invite you to their area to do a training. How can folks find you? Well, I want to respond first emotionally what you just said. I just thought, just flashed on if that was, I don't know. If I'm remembered as he reminded us, to be more human or yeah, that's a, that's, I've lived a good life. Yeah. And for any time I didn't do that, I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, jimthomas.care, www.jimthomas.care or coloradoeft.com. That's talks a lot about the therapy intensive I do. So my, my, the saw I've been sharpening for about 12 years now is, People come see me two, three days in Lakewood from all around the country, Canada, like the, um, and we plunge in and I, I'm a very much a plunger when it comes to EFT and going for yeah. the heart of the matter. And um, I, I love that. And um, if you're in a residential or wilderness program, um, we have a training coming up. I don't know if this will be posted by them, but in June in Florida, they're limited and you have to be either inpatient residential or wilderness so that 
Um, mm -hmm. It's like a cultural thing where they can all relax because there's a shared experience when you, you have that responsibility 24 seven for clients. Um, and then in, in um, September, I believe it's like a, Friday, September, I want to say September 17th and 18th, I'm going to be doing EFT and addiction for the, um, the Houston and San Antonio and Austin communities through Joe Contu is inviting me to come down and do that. And I think there, he's talking about maybe having an online option that you could, you know, if you don't want to go to Texas, um, mm -hmm. or that way. but that's, that's basically what I'm doing right now. So do people find your trainings on jimthomas.care? Do they go to ISET? Or if they want to reach out to you and say, hey, Jim, would you come to our community and do a training or come to our residential? Yeah, you can get contact info through through the gym or just, um, yeah, just email me. At, um, it's Institute for Change at msn.com, but you can find contact info at jimthomas.care. And, Perfect. Yeah. They can reach out to you and, and just thank you again so much for just touching us with your humanity and just the love that you have for people in their pain and their struggles. And it, it's just an incredible blessing to be able to train with you and under you and um, just to have you on our show. So again, just thank you so, so much, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. And thank you to our viewers. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, I will put a link to Jim's website under the description for this video. So you can just click on it, go right to his website, I really invite you to look him up, to reach out to him, email him and organize a community event where you can have them come either speak to your EFT community, or if you're in a residential treatment program and you guys are always looking for workshops and presenters to come out, it's a fantastic resource. And of course, check out some of our other videos that we've done on this, um, on my EFT talk series on We Heart Therapy. And um, so with that, we're going to bid you guys farewell until the next time. And thank you so much. Make sure that you hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Don't forget to buy my book, Using Relentless Empathy in the Therapeutic Relationship, Connecting with Challenging and Resistant Clients for Helping Professionals. Available on Amazon or on my website, www.drbugatti.com.